Wow. Was that gloomy? Junior Hockey Advisor, we are going to get in the ditch tonight. We're going to talk about the underbelly of junior hockey. We're going to talk about the dirt, the dark. Get ready. It's going to be fun tonight. Well, it's time to bring in the other half of this. Mike Bloom. I'm Jeff Colson. This is Junior Hockey Advisor. How you doing, Mike? I'm good, Jeff. How are you today? Everything good? I can't be better. I feel like dancing. I feel like doing a mamba. Smiling. <laughs> oh, don't go there. <laughs> Just feel like dancing. So, hey, we got a lot to do tonight. I don't know if we're going to get through all this. We are going to discuss, get rid of the background music here little R&B I had going. Uh, We're going to discuss the dark side of hockey. You and I had talked. There's an article that came out. It was posted on our discussion group. One of our members posted it about a lawsuit. And the more I read it today and the more I started uh, trying to get an opinion on it, I thought, you know what? I'm not sure this is a good topic yet. I think (laughs) it's a good, well, and hear me out. Um, And this is why I was calling you a little bit ago. Um, I think we're in a situation where you need to let that flush out a little bit more. Uh, just to, so if you haven't seen it on the discussion group, it's a story about a lawsuit that is uh, started or initiated uh, against, I, I believe it was the CHL in general, wasn't it, Mike? I think so. Yeah. And it claims that. The uh, CHL specifically. Right. And it's, it's claiming that yeah, the, the, the basic sense of it, to, to kind of paraphrase the the whole lawsuit is players are taken advantage of. Players are disposable. And, you know, I can't disagree, but I can't completely agree. And I think we we got to kind of take that and step aside first and maybe talk about all of the things in hockey that may not be considered fair or may be considered nefarious, may be considered deceitful, um, and look at some of these things. Now, you know, I got I to gotta paraphrase uh, to everybody. This is not a situation where – I'm trying to be negative towards our sport. You know, Mike and I dearly love this sport. We live and breathe this sport. We bleed this sport. And, uh, you know, I see 99.9% of the time you you are around me watching this. You're around Mike. You're watching us. Uh, we're positive about this. We always look at the bright side, you know, and we can even do the little dance. Always look at the bright. Never mind. We are, we're, we're positive on this. And tonight, though, we're going to take a different approach. We're going to look at the other sides. We need your help, though. You know, if you see other things we're not talking about, chime in. You got questions on what we're talking about? Chime in. You got comments? Chime in. We'll throw the comments up as they come along, and uh, we'll we'll get involved with the chat with you, and we'll enjoy this. So are you ready, Mike? I'm ready. I'm excited to see what you have in store for us. Well, I, I, if modern technology works, it'll be great, but uh, I'm not sure if uh, – I don't, I'm not sure I'm up to the, the task of doing this right all the way because I am who I am and I do what I do. So uh, I did put a little, uh, some slides together to make it easier for us. I just got to get to them. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're just going to pick out one thing at a time and we're going to discuss it. And these are in no order. They're in no uh, level of severity. Some of these are little things. Uh, and by, by no means, even though I've got like 17 or 18 things that I I thought of and brainstormed, uh, it's not an inclusive list. There'll be things that I forgot. There'll be things that you might think are more serious, but let's just jump in and go. And, and, uh, while I worry about this, I know what the first topic is and, uh, I'm going (coughs) to get this up as we're going here. First topic is hazing. All right. I'll give you my opinion, Mike. You jump in or cut me off or hold your tongue, whatever you want to do. Uh, hazing still exists. Hazing's still there. Um, is it different than it was 10 years, 20 years ago? Absolutely. But there's still old school programs, owners, general managers, coaches that still believe that hazing is the, the rite of passage. And it gets carried down. Every team is the image of its ownership, its coaches, its management. Every team. There isn't a team out there that doesn't, uh, you know, and, and if, it, if it doesn't match the coaches, one of two things happen. Either new management comes in or a new coach comes in because, you know, 99% of the time they they dovetail together. 
Um, what forms of hazing do I know about right now? It can be little things. Uh, it could be, you know, when you're on the road, on the bus, all rookies sit side by side while everybody else gets one or two seats. Two seats because then they can lay across and actually take a nap using both seats. Um, and if you played junior hockey or college hockey or pro hockey, you know that that has existed in your past too. Um, that's a that's a little thing. Uh, being relegated to sleep in the in the tub when you're on the road on road trips or sleep on the floor uh, because people don't want to share a queen size bed. This is more a tier three level, tier three level that's usually uh, two or three or four to a room depending on who the coach is. And uh, rookies get that, you know, obviously carrying the bags, that's been a big one for years. These are subtle things, but it gets, some programs still have the old school where uh, the veterans on the team douse all the player, the rookies players gear and water, skates, helmets, gloves, elbow pads, socks, pants, jerseys, and they skate in practice with wet gear the whole practice. That, you know, if you've ever had to do that, that adds, you know, 10, 20, 30, I don't know what it adds, but it adds a, a heck of a lot of weight to your gear. So th that's hazing from my perspective. Is it still there? Yes, it's still there. Um, is it to the point where you, uh, I mean, one of my old friends, old teammates, uh, a couple years older than me, uh, was at the University of Michigan prior to me getting there and was, uh, was taken out. They got him drunk. They stripped all of his clothes off and left him about five miles from campus. And it was big, big news. I mean, there's other teams that's happened up in Canada where a coach drops a team off two miles away from uh, where the rink is for a game. The whole team's got to walk in. Or you try to stuff as many guys into the bathroom and uh, you know, on the bus and uh, put all the rookies in the bathroom and make them stay there for X amount of time. All these are hazing things. Some of them are, are innocent. I don't even know if you can use the word innocent anymore, but these, these are there at some extent still. Uh, I, I know from my players uh, growing up, I, mean, I should say my kids growing up, they both experienced different forms of hazing at different levels across the board, uh, all the way into college, uh, juniors and college. I know when I was a coach, there were players that always thought it was upon themselves to do something along those lines to break in or to uh, to uh, get the rookies ready, you know. So that that's my perspective on this. Uh, Mike, tell me what you think. Yeah, I don't think I could be any uh, further against hazing than uh, I am. And I have that from the experience of being a player. And I also was in a fraternity in college where we actually got kicked off campus while I was there because of hazing and whatever else. And from my perspective, I think it's the stupidest thing that has like literally no value to do. Um, so, it, you know, some of the things that you mentioned are more like you got to earn your stripes when it's like the rookies have to, you know, fill the water bottles or have to, you know, do certain things like that's fine for me. I don't mind that, but um, you know, any of the other stuff, like even jamming a bunch of guys in the uh, bus bathroom or, you know, getting into anything when it comes to drinking or, you know, some of them can be um, way too much into like the nudity and, and all that that stuff that comes along with it. That has no like advantage of getting through any of that stuff or it doesn't do anything for the team. If anything, it, it really jeopardizes, uh, you know, your credibility as an organization and, you know, the leadership group of that team or whatnot. So I couldn't be further against that kind of stuff. I think it's ridiculous. And uh, it has tamed down, but like you said, there's still programs that have been in the news, you know, recently getting busted with that kind of stuff. And, you know, it just, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Like it's just stupid stuff that uh, shouldn't happen anymore. Yeah. Hey, you actually handled your solo pretty good there. <laughs> Jumped on and gone. So, okay. So that's one. Uh, I'm going to pull up the screen share here. And uh, we will look at this. Tell me when you see that. Oh, okay. It's not going to let me do that. That's fine. Anticlimactic. All right. Yeah, I know. That's terrible. <laughs> so the next, the next one, billets. A lot of stuff there. And there's a couple comments coming in. Um, yeah. So I'm going to keep the, the things that are being mentioned so far. Yes. The, both of those 
or all three of those so far are going to get mentioned. Uh, but let's talk about billeting in, in the negative side. Uh, Mike, do you want to start off on this one? Jump in if you feel like I'm, you know, taking too much control of this because I want to make sure your your fresh points are are out on this too. Well, what's your, you know, bringing up billeting? Are you talking about like some of the pitfalls that happen? Absolutely, with- the dark side. You know, the <laughs> creepy stuff. You know, the underbelly. You know, yeah. the the you come home and all the lights are off and. Your billet mom is sitting there with a candle under her face. Okay, let's you know. <laughs> let's keep it clean here. No, no, no. That was creepy, not dirty. Oh, uh, well, it was going somewhere. It you know, was going where, somewhere. She was glowing in the dark and just looking, you know, spooky. No, I I'll give you a few of my my part. Um, there there was a billet situation in, in our league where, uh, and it may still exist. I'm not going to mention teams. I'm not going to give you which division, but um, there were six, seven, eight. Uh, kids living with one billet family and the billet family collected a premium to live there. And uh, they were two to three to a room, big house. There wasn't a problem with, you know, I I don't have a problem with two in a room and under certain circumstances, three in a room, but their breakfast was the dad put oatmeal on in a big vat and you went and you got oatmeal, just kind of like being in prison and getting gruel. You got (laughs) scoop and you know, that was it. At night, it was pasta or rice, and uh, the, to the point where the kids were actually going out and going through drive through and, and getting a, a, a chicken patty on a sandwich to bring home to put in their meal so they got some protein. Or they would get a to-go box, a to-go box with the, the pasta or the starch, and taking that out to a fast food place and getting a cheap piece of meat to, to throw in there too. Um, that's insane, but it went mm-hmm. on, it, is, it was going on for years this way. And, uh, I mean, they, they had their own bathroom as a player, but once again, it was six to eight guys sharing one bathroom in a house. Uh, that's, that's more of a dorm and they, they weren't given lunch and there were times, and this is something I've heard many, many, many a times where a, and this is, this is usually when it's a single parent, single kid, uh, that's billeting uh, players where they, will actually give the kids, the, the billet kids, the hockey players, one meal, and then they'll order DoorDash or they'll bring in something or they'll make another meal. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a fun one. When my daughter, when she was billeting in Canada for juniors, she was in a situation where um, they had one one kid in the family, parents and one kid, one daughter. And uh, they actually would cook a, a real nice like steak dinner and they'd make macaroni and cheese and hot dogs for my daughter and sit at the same table and think nothing of it at all. Think nothing of it all. And their, their position on it was you're not paying the bills. You only pay us enough to feed you this. And we're going to, we're going to comply with what, you know, the billet rules are. So if they had a steak dinner, she sat there and watched with eating hot dogs and, and macaroni and cheese. And, and this went on the whole season. And at first it was kind of funny, you know, as a dad, you know, I, I was like, hey, you know, but towards the middle and the end, especially when you'd meet these th- this family in the stands for games, uh, it, it got to be downright cruel, you know. Yeah. You know, they're 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 drinking soda and they make tang for her or water for her, you know, and it just bizarre. It was almost like one of those Disney movies with Cruella or you know, some you know, and then there's the always the little girl that's mopping the floors, you know, looking for the, it was snow white, isn't it? Is that the one? I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember which one it is, but you know, so that's one of them too. I, I uh, Cinderella maybe what's that Cinderella. Maybe yeah. Cinderella. I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure somebody will jump in and tell us uh, which, what are your thoughts on that, Mike? Well, I'll take a different angle. Um, you talked about more of like the player situation. If anyone is here, you know, considering being a billet, um, if you have a teenage daughter, please do not billet any of the players. Um, you just put yourself in such a bad spot by doing that. And there's just so many stories where, um, you know, that that doesn't turn out the way you had hoped. And uh, you just don't put yourself in that situation. So, you know, you got to figure these these kids are, are young and, you know, they're curious. And there's a lot of time that, uh, you know, they're milling around the house and whatnot. It's just not a great it's not a great situation to put yourself in. So, you know, avoid that if you can. So that's the one thing that, uh, 
you know, I hear over and over and over again when when uh, kids are in that situation, I always say, why in the hell would you put yourself in that situation? And uh, time and time again, they do. So if you're listening, don't do it. <laughs> fully agree, fully agree, fully agree. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it just reminds me of the, the, the uh, Rob Lowe hockey movie. What the heck was that called? Young uh, Blood. Young Blood. Uh, a lot of the things we're talking about here are, are things that you'll see in some of the movies out there. If not, you know, some of them that have become urban legends in the hockey circles, uh, they absolutely happen. But let's get on to a different one because I want to try to fly through these. I've got like 18. I'm not sure if we'll get through them all, but uh, we'll get through as much as possible. Next one, contracts. Mostly when I say contracts, I'm talking about tier three contracts where you're actually uh, paying to play on a team. Um, there's there's so much to talk about on this issue. Uh, and, you know, one of the comments that already came in is um, the, uh, and I'll actually put the comment up. It's from somebody that's watching us on Facebook. And the comment is there's another uh, junior hockey Facebook group uh, where the group owner claims that not all USPHL players pay the same amount, i.e. Uh, the better players pay less than everyone else. Any truth to this? Mike, you want to go first or you want me to? Hey, go ahead. Take it. Yes, it's true. It is against the NCAA rules. Uh, I know this site, and I know where they got the information. They got it from uh, our videos and, and some of our past content that we put out. The NCAA, and this is the website you need to put right down, it, it is College Hockey Inc. It explains all the rules of how contracts or, or, or agents, free. Uh, when I say agents, family advisors, and this is mostly done via family advisors. Uh, and you could it, it could be a straight out offer from a team. Hey, you come here and you pay 50% less because you're a good player and we want you. And good players beget other players. That That is a true statement. If I have a superstar on my team or a really strong player, that will you know entice other players to come join that team because they've got a really good player. The leading scorer in the league, uh, you know, yada, yada. Uh, and at some levels it's, uh, well, that guy, that guy's got a, a commitment already, a D one commitment already or something like that. But you cannot, if, if one person gets a discount, the discount has to be offered to everybody. So if somebody on that team is playing for free, free has to be offered to everybody. If somebody's get 10, gets 10% off, 10% has to be offered to everybody. It's right in the rules. Now here's the, the problem. Here's one of the dirty little secrets. The NCAA really doesn't have time or the wherewithal or the resources to track down these situations in junior hockey. They've got their hands full with all the things that are going on right now with the portals and with the uh, name, image, and likeness in basketball and football. You know, the, the NCAA has got their own issues right now, and this is verbatim from them. Hey, Jeff, I see what you're saying when I bring this up, and I've had direct conversations with the NCAA we just don't have the resources to track that down. So in other words, you know, it's not directly affecting a current NCAA athlete. They're not going to track it down and they're not out there looking for it. And if you complain to the NCAA, I hate to say it, but good luck. You know, maybe, maybe if they keep, keep getting complaints, they'll do something about it. Now, some of you will take advantage of us. Some of you will say, you know, hey, that's fine. If somebody wants to give me 50% off. The, the tuition's 10000 and I'm only having to pay $5,000, i am going to take it. I, I can't tell you if that's good or bad or right or wrong. In my ethics, it doesn't work, but everybody's different. I, I'm not going to judge you if you do that. However, my world is that if little Jeffy here does that with his kid, I'm the first one the NCAA is going to catch, okay? Hmm. And that's the way I look at the world. You know, the first person to hammer and the, the one they'll make an example of is me. And I never want to have my kid in a situation where I'm going to be the example. So uh, that's that's the way I'm looking at that right now. Mike, anything to add? I don't think so. You you hit you hit that one out of the park. Well, there's there's other conversation. We can do a whole con you know a whole conversation on you know look at the bells and whistles. But you know the, the one thing Mike had a real good you know uh, direct point about you know billets and what he thinks there. Mine is read the contract. Take the time to read it. 90%, and I'm not kidding. I used to be a Tier 3 owner. I've owned three different Tier 3 teams. I would say when I put a contract out, 
I'd wince because I'm married to a lawyer. My daughter's a lawyer. And when people just take the contract and go, where do I sign? I go, hang on, hang on. Let's go through this. Here, let's go through this first paragraph. I'll paraphrase it for you, but I want you to really understand what you're signing. That is me. It shouldn't be me, you know, force feeding it on somebody. You really should want to read that contract and spend a little bit of time with it. So, especially if you're playing in an independent junior league, because there's less, uh, you know, oversight, right? Guide, yeah, guidance and guidelines and everything. I've had a couple of players in my in my past that went on to uh, play juniors and they thought they were going to be playing on a specific team. And once they got over there, they got moved down to the lower team. And uh, at that point, we're like, you know, I didn't agree to this and and wanted to come back and play U18 for me. And uh, in order to get out of the contract that they signed, they had to pay that club 13 grand to get out of it. And then they obviously had to pay for playing for me for that year. So that was a very expensive lesson for them, but uh, it happened. And I don't want to say it happens all the time, but it does happen, you know, periodically, you know, every year. So let's, um, let's jump onto another one. There's, like I said, and some of these overlap, some of them you'll go, Hey, that, you kind of mentioned that mm -hmm. before. Um, filler players. And maybe some of you don't know what a filler player is. And this is at the tier three level. Actually, Filler players can happen all the way up to the NHL. You know, and what a filler player is, is somebody that fills out the roster um, where the coaches, either through bias or through conscious decision, uh, don't have any real reason to want the kid to play. There's no incentive for him to play. He's there because the kid, the coach wants to run three lines, but he needs a fourth line. Does it happen? It absolutely happens. It happens in almost every tier three league. Uh, across the board. I mean, I could, I can name 20, 25 teams right now that use filler players. They pay the bills. They're there in practice. Do they get power play time? No. Do they get a regular shift? Most likely not. Uh, do they play on the PK? No. And uh, all this time, the player thinks he's investing his time for next year. Oh, I just got to, I just got to wait it out till next year. I just got to put my time in next year. I'll move up into a better role. Because that's what they've been told and taught, and that's what they see in the, the NCAA ranks. That's what they see in the, even the pro ranks of the sport. The longer you stay on the roster, you keep moving up. And they don't because the coach never intended on moving the player up. Mike, anything? Yeah, and I think filler players, in your example, can go even further where it's not a guy that's in and out of the lineup, but it's literally a guy that's practicing the whole time. So, you know, some of these rosters – you can have 30 guys on the roster. You can have 35 guys at some point, even if you're, you're rostering 25 or whatever it is you have to get down to, you still may have an extra three, four, five, six guys that are just solely there practicing. And there's no way they can even get into the game because they're not on any of the protected lists. Um, but they're paying the bills and, you know, they're, they're obviously out there for practice to try to help develop. And, you know, you hang that carrot over their head of, uh, you know, next year you're going to be able to move up into a bigger role and whatnot. And uh, I'd be curious to see how many of those kids actually do. Yeah. And, and to counter what you do as a parent or as a player in this situation, you got to get into social media. You got to look at the roster. You know, maybe you see a lineup sheet and you see what their fourth line is. Reach in, reach out on social media, watch their games on, on uh, tape. You know, almost every junior team is on live barn or they're on uh you know, flow hockey, they're, they're on hockey TV, whatever they're using, or maybe they just video their games on YouTube, but watch the games, figure out who the fourth line is, see how they're being treated. You know, you can see how many guys are on the roster and uh, see if those guys are getting nice time, see if they're, they're part of it because, you know, it's incumbent on the person paying the money to make sure the product is right. Um, and, and Mike's point is valid. You cannot, you cannot expect, you know, there's now there's several leagues that have no oversight from USA Hockey, you really don't have a governing body to turn to with some leagues, and you just got to be careful with that. I'm not saying I wouldn't play in those leagues. I would just know what, you know, buyer beware. Know what you're getting into before you actually do it. So, all right, next topic, trades. Come on, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, when it comes to trades, I don't think people actually understand – they have more power in the situation than, than uh, they actually do. 
but there are plenty of horror stories where, you know, a kid is in two or three different spots in one year, you know, because for whatever reason, either he's valuable enough to acquire more assets or he's, uh, you know, got some issues off the ice that people think, oh, I'm going to be the one to fix them. And, you know, he realized, nope, <laughs> let's keep them going, you know, to the next place. And, uh, you know, obviously that's not a great situation from a league perspective or for that individual family in that kid's perspective. Um, but I, I know that there used to be the wild West. I think with the USA hockey guidance and, and most of the junior leagues and, and even in some of the other ones, I think they're getting better when it comes to making trades and sending players elsewhere, uh, than it was in the past. So you probably have a lot of like good examples from when you were doing this in years past. Uh, maybe not as many, you know, I'm living in this world for maybe 10 years. You're living in this world for like 30 years. So, you know, it's, it's different. Yeah. yeah but I've got some recent ones and, and some of this is, um, you know, between the United States and Canada, um, I tend to see more old school coaches in Canada than I do in the United States. I tend to see more old school co coaches um, that still play by the rules from, you know, 1960 and 1970 um, in their, their mindset. And that's not, I'm not making a positive or negative statement there. I'm just trying to state what I see. Now I'll give you one from my family because uh, you know, I'm willing to throw it out there. Uh, when my son went to the AJHL as a rookie uh, coming out, he played one year of U18 and then he went to the AJHL. Uh, the, the coach and the general manager sat him down right away and said uh, two things right off the bat. If you're looking for money, we'll give you a couple names of teams that may pay you, but we're not paying you. That floored me because I'm coming from what I consider squeaky clean, clean USA hockey juniors where pay a player to what that, you know, but you know, that's the underbelly. That's the dark side. I'm not going to blow anybody in on, you know, what programs did or did not do that at the time, but there were players or excuse me, teams. And there were teams that had communal cars where there was a team car. All those things are a little iffy, maybe not so much in Canada because the NCAA isn't, you know, breaking NCAA rules aren't as much of a, uh, a situation there, especially guys that may have played in the WHL or played in the OHL first, where there was a lot of compensation and like ways like that. And it was legal. Um, but in my son's situation, our advice to him, mom and dad, was get up there, work hard, keep your head low. You know, get up there, work hard. So he he'd actually started out really good. First 10, 10 games as a defenseman, he was one of the leading scorers on the team. He was doing great. Um, and they met weekly with him. The, the team had a professionalism to him. Uh, there was I still love this team. This, this is not a knock on the team. But what happened was they met weekly with the players and he asked Adam what he thought about his, his playing time. And Adam said something instead of keeping his mouth shut. And as soon as he said something about playing time, and in fact, I think he brought it up because there was a large showcase and there was several, you know, prominent D1 schools there that asked, you know, or, or let Adam know they were coming up and wanted to watch him play. And uh, he got benched in a regular rotation. Okay. There was rookies that were, cycling in and out of the, rot, the the lineup, and it was his turn. So it was nothing malicious, but Adam said, hey, I'm one of the leading scorers, you know, why? And they said, okay, we'll take care of the problem. He was traded the next day. <laughs> Boom, just like that, because it's a business and because it's old school. The mindset isn't let's work through this and communicate. Hey, look, we gave you a chance. We gave you an opportunity. You question the way we do things, hit the road. And – once again, good program, you know, very naive kid. Maybe we gave him a little too much slack to have the, that, you know, to make his own decisions in those cases, but he was down the road the next day. So trades can happen with just a, just a slip of the tongue. And, and, you know, some coaches have very, very small, uh, let's change that. Some coaches have very large egos. And uh, instead of talking about the other anatomy, we'll talk about the ego. And, you know, if you brush them the wrong way, in your innocence, you might be a 17 or 18 or 19-year-old kid. You haven't done dealt with a, these these adult topics where, you know, negotiation and communication and how to resolve problems. These guys are masters at it. These guys have dealt with hundreds of players. This may be the first time you're sitting across the table with somebody you have you have to, like, 
build a relationship with and try to work with. And you're not skilled. You just don't have the skills yet. You don't have the skill set. Th thought process, Mike. Well, I think the big distinction there to call out is the fact that you were talking about, you know, a Canadian junior league and how things are operated there versus the U S uh, cause in the U S you know, if, if all of a sudden you get traded on a whim and you say, well, I'm not going to report there, it blows the deal up. Like that deal doesn't go through. So, you know, I guess the differences are, you know, uh, between countries and the way that the leagues are set up because, you know, that, that, that scenario with your son would have never happened in the null. And if it did, it would be because it would be because the, the kid, you know, just didn't understand that you do have some leverage in that situation too. You don't see that as much. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say it's not there because I've, I've, I've seen it in every league. Okay. Absolutely. I've seen it in every league. The other part of the down, the, the underbelly of this is be careful who advises you. An advisor, instead of your kid, can open his mouth and you could get blackballed for the rest of the time you're playing junior hockey. An advisor can say something or take a role that he's got the power to come in and negotiate for you, even if you don't know about it. So it's extremely, extremely important to know what your advisor's role is and really manage that role so that they're never speaking to the team without your approval first. And even sometimes when you have said, hey, I don't want you talking to anybody unless we talk first, they still might do it. So, you know, how you figure that out is on your own to keep that straight. But man, oh man, I've seen player after player basically ruined because their advisor steps in without any knowledge. There was an advisor that's still in the business that was listed as a player director for an organization, not in the null. And he was had four or five guys he recommended to the team, and he was calling up the coach and going, hey, we need to change this power play. We need this guy and this guy in the power play. And the coach is going, what are you talking about? You know, wh where did you think you ever had the right to say anything about how we play or anything? So, that, you know, that goes along with the trade issue because advisors can, can screw up and get you traded just as fast as anything. Of course, kids can get traded because they don't have effort. You know, they have a bad attitude. You know, there's a lot of things, but I'm just talking about things that are, you know, not always under your control or, or easy to see. Yes, Mike? No, Mike? Yeah? Yeah, I think we've, uh, you know, beat the dead horse on that one. Okay. Um, <laughs> just to add, and I know I've missed so many of your comments because the timeliness, we'll get back to some of them as we go. So few advisors <laughs> are competent. Do your homework, people. Many times advisors are clueless and uh, will be a detriment. Yeah, uh, there are good advisors out there and there's strong advisors out there. And that's why you ask a lot of questions. And we've covered this ad nauseum on how to get to them. Let's get to coaches. Got a lot of things to say on coaches. Um, coaches can be the darkest part of your whole experience, or they can be a bright part, or they can be a non-factor. Um, you always want a kid to come back and say, oh, man, I'd play for that guy forever. You know, that was my favorite experience. That was my favorite coach. Uh, he worked me hard, but, man, we got a lot out of it. But, you know, let's let's look at a little bit about some of the things that can happen. Uh, and we've already covered some of them. You know, sitting players that are filler players, putting them in the stands, you know, trading players, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, one of the issues that you can look at right away is uh, – biases and some of the biases that come along with, uh, with coaches. Um, yeah, there's racial bias that comes into play. There's uh economic bias. Hey, you know, this is tier three. I, that, that kid, that kid's dad's got a lot of money. Maybe he'll buy an advertisement in the program. You know, maybe he'll, uh, you know, sponsor the team for a road trip or whatever the case may be. Um, there's natural biases. And that's when, you know, a coach just sees a kid that looks like it's effortless to him and decides, you know, that's, that's the kid he wants. Oh, sorry about that, Mike. <laughs> That's uh, me listening. Mike's picking his nose, and I uh, put it back on camera there when he thought he had a break. Um, there's all kinds of bias. Um, I, I would say that uh, confirmation bias, where a kid makes one mistake on the ice, and the coach is going, "See, see, you know, you you made that mistake. That's why you don't play more." And there's 14 or 15 examples of other kids doing the same thing. But since the kid had the coach had a talk with your kid 
and your kid doesn't get ice time, he's on the fourth line. He does it once in a game, and the coach is going, yep, yep, see that? There, there it is on tape. I, I want to show, show it to you. That happens all the time. Although lines one, two, and three may have done it four times a piece during the game. So that's where the conversations with the coaches and and when you meet the coach for the first time, introducing some of these things and discussing them without calling him out are important. You know, you have to try to get to the point where you can angle conversations to see what kind of biases he's bringing into the game <laughs> across the board. Um, the focus on winning, putting so much emphasis on winning that he runs two lines. He runs three lines. The same five kids are on the power play all the time. Um, the, the failure to grow talent, the failure to put time in with lower level players in the team, you know, that's, that's huge with a lot of coaches. Um, a lack of coaching, understanding advanced systems, understanding, trying to get better learning that, that one of the first things I would always ask a coach is, Hey coach, what's your philosophy on coaching? You know, what kind of systems do you run? You know, what are you still, do you still participate in seminars? Do you, are you doing it just, and, and these got to be done in a positive way. They can't be, you can't call a coach out when you're first meeting them. If your kids go to that team, but you can get, you can strike up a conversation and a lot of coaches like to talk about themselves. So, you know, if you strike it up the right way, they're just going to roll. They're just, <laughs> you have to find a way to shut the conversation down. Um, and I would say that the bias issue is so big because, they can carry so many different biases in uh, that you really have to know, uh, go, go in with a game plan on how you're going to discuss this. And hopefully you're doing it on a Zoom call. You're doing it on a face-to-face -a -face when, you're, when you're talking to the coach. But, you know, I would never, ever want anybody out there to go to a team without having a conversation with the coach. Now, if it's a USHL team and you feel like I'm going to that team no matter what, then maybe that's not as important. Anything below that, I think you should absolutely try to get a conversation with a coach before you go there. Thoughts, Mike? Yeah, the one thing also about coaches that drives me nuts is when, you know, they talk about how, you know, they're going to advance their players and, you know, they, they get all these different kids into school, you know, if they're a junior coach and they can get them there and they never pick up the phone and they don't work on behalf of their players to actually connect those dots. They just kind of sit back and wait for, you know, teams to come to them and, and ask about certain players or whatnot, because uh, it's such a disservice to the the kids on their team that they're not doing outreach themselves to, you know, drum up exposure and conversation about their own players. And that happens way more than, than it should. You know, there's a lot of coaches that, you know, just focus on coaching their team and doing video and, you know, they live like in the moment and then they're not thinking about, well, you know, I should be connecting with this school about this player or, you know, this kid wants to go here. You know, let me see if I can get one of the coaches to connect with them and doing all that extra work because you're doing it from, you know, the on behalf of your players to try to help them advance and move on. And it is a ton of work, but there's a lot yep. of coaches that aren't willing to do it or they'll put it onto the player and say, you reach out to these teams and if they have any interest, they can call me. It's like, that's just not as effective, you know? That, yep. So that bothers me. Well said. Well said. Next topic. Homesickness. You know, it's it's a, an issue, and I'm going to tie two together. I'm going to tie homesickness and support together. So we're going to we're going to knock off two at one time. Homesickness is real. Players go through it. Especially, it doesn't have to be you know, you're you live in Rochester, New York, and you're playing in Alberta and you're homesick because of the distance, the distance could be two hours. The distance could be very small, but when the walls start closing in, the coach communication slows down. Maybe you're a rookie and there's a little bit of hazing going on. You feel ostracized. Um, and you haven't you know, found that friend on the team yet, or the friend away from the team yet. Um, uh, homesickness is real. It's a big, big issue. Some teams do a great job of team building. They do a great job of having the, the captains aware of the situation and looking for it. I mean, uh, when I coached, I'd, I'd meet with my captains daily and I go, okay, who do we have to worry about? That was the first question I said, who do we have to worry about? Who's given any signs? And we actually talked about the signs with the whole team. Here's the things you look for. If somebody looks depressed, if somebody is starting to, you know, go away from the team and, you know, do things by themselves, 
Uh, there's all kinds of little signals there. But if your team doesn't have a strategy to support, and that's the other thing too, if you're in one of those filler players on a bad team with no support and you're getting homesick, I mean, that's a death spiral. There's no other way to put it. That's a death spiral. You're putting yourself into all kinds of, you know, mental health issue areas that, you know, it's it's really hard to come out of that. And uh, it's really hard to see a positive come out of it. Now, most kids can make it through the year, but many kids can't. They they basically, they pull the shoot. I mean, some ask for a trade and some just say, We're, I'm done. At the tier three level, they'll, there are kids that will go home for uh, Thanksgiving or they'll go home for Christmas and dis- decide that they're not going to go back and re- re- go back to that team. So have you seen any of that, Mike? Have you dealt with that at all? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's I mean, again, these kids are moving away. It's just like kids that go to college and they're not playing any sports, but they're moving away to go to college. They get homesick, too. Which oh, is absolutely. Normal, you know, the only so difference I, is that at, at high school, you're done with high school. A lot of junior players are younger than that college kid. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's the part I was talking about. Yeah, um, exactly. Roster size. We already kind of killed that. Um, but, you know, that's. That's the dirty part of the game is this whole roster size and playing time um, at tier three. Does every team do it? No. Are, are most teams equitable? Yes. Most teams try to be very fair. And, you know, e- even in my situation in the past, I had a guy that was a clear number 25 on my team. But when we sat down with the parents and we sat down with the player, we said, you're coming in as the 25. If you want this spot, I can't promise you anything. You know, if, if that's what you want, and he desperately wanted to be on the team, I can accommodate, but I can't promise you anything. Now, we did end up getting him in games. We got him dressed for a few games during the year. But the, the beginning of the season, we signed him up with a clear expectation that there was zero, zero coming his way and that we had kids that would take that spot knowing that. But if he wanted it, he was first in line. So, you know, yeah, it, it happens all the time. Playing time and roster size – it's a bitch and it's it's a dirty part of the game, but it happens. Yeah. And that's where also doing your homework on the league and uh, what their restrictions are, you know, because if you play, you know, and this mostly happens at the tier three level, but, um, you know, anything that falls under the USA hockey umbrella, you don't, you know, you can only have 25 guys and then 23 guys and things like that. And they may have a couple other guys that are there practicing and whatnot in case of injury or whatnot, but, it's not like they can have 35 guys or 40 guys that, you know, are they're just collecting all this money and and that's how they can cut deals with, you know, guys that are paying half or aren't paying at all because they've got other guys that are kind of paying for them that are, you know, bopping around and whatnot. So you hear those stories more frequently at certain clubs and certain leagues and, you know, you just have to do your homework so you're not in that situation. When I was coming out of the Marine Corps, uh, I think I had three or four months left the division one team in San Diego, there used to be a school called USIU United States international university, top 20 hockey team. Uh, one of the first on the West coast, uh, good, good, solid program. The guy, the coach team was Brad Buteau. He replaced Herb Brooks at Minnesota when Herb Brooks went to the Olympic team. So that was their street cred. When USA USIU got him, that was a huge, huge deal in hockey at the time. Uh, little did I know they got him because he got bounced out of Minnesota for doing the same thing he did at USIU. I went out for a skate with the team, and uh, right or wrong, I don't know if it was uh, within the rules or not back in the day, uh, but I was skating with the team three or four days a week, uh, the, the college team, and uh, I thought it was an open tryout at all times. There were 40, 42 kids on the ice, and uh, what he'd do is he would, he would give out eighth or a tenth of scholarships, so every kid <laughs> could say he was on scholarship. So he had this massive amount of kids uh, that he always had out there, and uh, so that that happens at the college ranks too. Not as much. Uh, you don't see that drastic extreme now. Um, at least I haven't heard of that in years. But that 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 cost him the Minnesota job, and it probably cost him uh, others too. Um, nutrition. I only got two things to say about it. We already talked about nutrition with the billets. It, you know, as much as you can to dig into your billet situation and your billet family, and even asking them about you know what what the daily meal plan how. To, you know, what do you supply? What don't you supply? What's the variety of meals? All those things asking him, but here's the one, here's the junior one. Here's the tier three junior one. You get done with a game, the coach and the bus driver want to get on the road so they can get back. 
and they throw five pizzas in the back of the bus. They literally walk on and just say, start handing out pizza boxes. And normally it's cheese pizza. They don't even have the dignity to put a pepperoni on the pizza. Okay. That's a reality. <laughs> it, knowing that, you ask the question. So on the road, how do you eat? You know, most teams will say, hey, look, we, we stay at hotels that always have a breakfast buffet. That's, that's huge. That is absolutely great because the kids can load up and they can take a banana and stick it in their pocket or a yogurt and stick it in their pocket for a snack. And the team usually, most tier three teams don't supply lunch. They supply breakfast and dinner. Lunch is on your own somewhere. And, you know, as long as you know the rules, it's fair. But if you're on a team that's just giving you pizza, you're not eating healthy. You're not recovering right. And, you know, it's incumbent to either accept that, which most situations you're going to accept it, and know how to counter it by picking up a sub before you leave the rink, packing a little cooler on, on the overnight trip so you've got food for that, you know, first night or the second night too. And you'll see a lot of kids that have those those little, uh, you know, whatever the, the, the top brand coolers are now, they carry those around. And that's why, you know, the food sucks on a lot of teams. Just got to get used to it. Mike? Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, the the quality of the food is one conversation, but the biggest thing is not feeding them enough. You know, if they're not getting enough food, that's the biggest issue. Yeah. We're both issues, but that's yeah. the biggest issue. Yeah, and, uh, you know, there's, there's better ways to do it. It doesn't cost much more, and, and this is me preaching, it doesn't cost much more to, to order Olive Garden, the big trays, have those trays right outside the locker room. So as soon as the kids are done showering, they go out, they get a plate, they can fill it up with pasta, salad, bread, uh, breadsticks, and at least they're getting you know a much more nutritious meal than just a plain pizza. So, uh, and thank you. Uh, you know, in, in some cases when you're on the road, the the road or the home team, um, like their billets or other people will get together and they'll like make pasta or tacos or whatever. So the team on the road when the game is over, because sometimes the game doesn't end until. 10 30 11 o'clock by the time they get out of the rink so it's not easy to grab food on your way back to the hotel so the that organization will kind of set up something or the billets will set up something to to feed the players on the away team before they go back to the hotel and then you know the the that team will reciprocate it when that when that program comes down to play them at their rank so there are things that organizations will do that kind of help that situation also yep and and better junior teams will also have a little training table set up in the locker room on the road or outside where they've got a bunch of apples. They've got bagels and peanut butter and jelly. They've got things that the kid can make a quick snack right after the game, you know, and, and have, have food before dinner. You know, so if the game, even if the game ends at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, they can still grab a couple things. Uh, they've got loaves of bread. They've got, uh, you know, maybe some, some ham and salami out there, whatever the case. And they've got drinks. They've got the Gatorades, the waters, the replacement fluids. So, um, you know, either way, that's that's uh, that's something to be considerate. Or you should consider when you're you're making all these moves. Hey, look, tonight we're talking about the the dirty side of hockey, the the underbelly of it. That we're in the ditch tonight. Um, we're not saying that this is every team. We're not saying this is uh, your team. We're giving you real life examples and real life situations and things that you have to be concerned about and look for, and almost a checklist of things just to, to know. You know, you're, you're probably in a situation where you have to accept some of them. Um, but, you know, the more you know, the more educated you are. Next week, next week, we're going to talk about summer scheduling. And we're going to talk about scheduling all next week. So, you know, hopefully you'll join us next week. And remember, like and follow us. You can do that on our Facebook page, uh, Junior Hockey Advisor Discussion Group. The, we also have a page. We'd love you to be a part of those. And also YouTube. Go to Junior Hockey Advisor YouTube. Uh, continuing down the list, Mike, injuries. Oh, this one, this one drives me nuts. Injuries. Do you want to start, Mike? Cause I'm going to go on a rampage on this. <laughs> I'd rather let you go. That way you don't want to jump over what I'm saying to get yours out. Um, <laughs> have a good insurance plan. Okay. That's the best. The best thing is don't let your kid get on the road without having, you know, your own good insurance, no matter what the team is telling you, Oh, we've got a doctor at every game. Oh, we've got a trainer. And if your kid is hurt, take the time to actually find out what the injury is in more detail than what you're hearing from your, your kid. Okay. 
if that means that you've got to say, Hey, look, I really want you to go see, you know, I want you to go to the clinic or I want you to go to the uh, emergency uh, care facility that's down the street or the hospital, get everything checked out. Um, I've seen horror stories, uh, with we, when we had three different junior teams at one point, uh, one of the teams was on the road, a player got hit in the thigh. Um, it looked like a thigh bruise. It became something called compartmentalization. I believe it is where the, 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 uh, the sack that the muscle sits in, the muscle expands out to the point where that there's damage done. That's like, can be permanent. Uh, fortunately, uh, this was with a family that, that, that the, uh, the family was traveling on the road to watch the son play and the dad was a doctor. So when they went into the emergency room, he knew, you know, what, what he was looking for ended up being surgery right away off of what looked like a bruise from the, from our coaching staff, coaching staff assessed it. The trainer assessed it from the, the home team is just being a bruise. So, um, you know, this is the one thing it's like, when we talked about support, when we talked about, you know, understanding there's some old school guys out there. When I say old school, you know, it's tape a bandaid on it and, uh, and don't complain. That mentality still is there. You know, you know, you see it all the way up through the NHL. We pride ourselves as a sport of playing through pain, playing through injury, uh, playing when other sports, you know, stop playing. Uh, that's great if you're getting paid $5 million a year, but if you're playing juniors and this is something that could, you know, put a permanent, um, uh, injury prolonged situation, uh, in your way, in your path going forward, um, you're going to get very, very little support from a lot of teams. There's a big section of teams that just go, you're injured, you know, you're off. Why don't you go home now? And when you get healthy, come back and we'll, we'll get you back in and get you skating again. That's the mentality. Now, don't get me wrong. In many cases, the injury, it is best to go home and it is best to spend time around your family and recuperate. But it's the mentality out of sight, out of mind. And uh, the, the, the team is going to go on. This is a business. The team is going to go on regardless of you if you're hurt. It's the way it is. Some teams you know, are compassionate. Some coaches and general managers and owners are very compassionate. Others aren't. You are responsible to find out, you know, and this is where it just takes so much to do your homework. And it doesn't always mean, <clears throat> it doesn't always mean face to face with your team. You could be asking other teams, other players, you know, what do you know about that team? What do you know about that coach? What do you know about, you know, or social media, L follow a kid that's hurt, see what he's doing now. Is he at home? Is he starting to say, you know, basically talking shit about the program now, which you'll see. Um, or is he still supportive and still feel part of it and still supporting the team as he's going through a short, medium, or long-term injury? Mike? Yeah, I think the thing that bothers me about organizations is a lot of times if a player gets injured in that game, you know, they're there to treat it, you know, with whatever trainers are there and whatnot. But then after that game is over, there's like no follow-up, you know, so the kid's on his own now to go to whatever – you know, if it's got to go to the clinic or he's got to schedule an appointment with like an actual doctor to be seen or whatever else, a lot of them, it falls short and it falls on the family who could be, you know, 3000 miles away or whatever to try to figure out where do we go and who do we call and what are the doctors out there or it's on the kid. And, and that's what you really want to try to find out. And just by asking an organization, they're not going to tell you that, but that's where you got to maybe talk to some people who have had kids that played on that team before or, you know, different things, because I got to tell you, like, I'm not a parent, but as a parent, if my kid were to get injured and I'm not a jump in the car and, and get there, you know, uh, distance, that's really stressful to try to figure out what to do next with your kid and things like that. Uh, especially if it's like anything with their teeth or, you know, obviously, um, you know, something that needs like, attention right away you know that's that's something that uh is is not all organizations are created equal let's put it that way and i don't know the right answer to this because some of it's just uh you know not practical if a kid you know god forbid breaks his leg in a game um the whole team can't stay overnight in the emergency room get out another room while they wait to assess the kid and you know get him get him back on track and figure out what the game plan to you know heal him and get him home um, and you know that, that that's not practical, but 
a lot of teams don't have a game plan. A lot of teams don't have, okay, if a player gets seriously hurt and he's got to stay when we're on the road, you know, how are we going to handle that? You know, is the assistant coach or the head coach or the trainer going to stay with the player um, and, you know, make sure that they both safely you know, get back? Uh, does the team send somebody out with a car to pick the player up the next day? You know, this is that also that support thing. Do you yeah. just leave them and say, okay, we'll get somebody here to pick you up tomorrow. Now that kid's there completely alone in a foreign city, you know, that, that that's a really hard thing. So once again, this is just talking to people and talking to, you know, your, your kid can get a lot of this information without even really trying if he just matches up with the right people on, on the social medias. Players talk about this stuff all the time. So that'll help a lot. Um, next one. This one's a, this one's a tough one to talk about. And thank you all for staying with us. We've had a great group tonight, a great size. This one uh, is alcohol and drugs. Alcohol and the vices. Um, Mike, you got to take this one first because I've been doing them all first. You take this one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's hard to talk about because you hope it never happens. But you know that, you know, for the most part, these kids are, you know, there's a lot of idle time. Just like in college, there's idle time. When you're playing juniors, there's idle time. And if you don't have a good leadership group or, you know, the billet program isn't strong to where they're kind of looking after each other also, or, you know, maybe there's a billet that the family travels a lot. So that's like kind of an open house and then it becomes a party house. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that can happen in junior hockey when it comes to that, you know, that type of thing that, you know, can spiral out of control. And, you know, in some cases, these kids are, you know, drinking for the first time or they're drinking in that type of quantity for the first time of like a, like a big rager, you bring in the hazing and, you know, other stuff into it. And it's, you know, it's not a good look and it, you know, can turn bad. And uh, it, it does happen, you know, from a drug perspective, um, you'd like to think that that's less likely because these kids are, you know, committed athletes and, you know, they, they're a little bit more concerned about what's going into their bodies than, um, you know, maybe just a normal kid or whatnot, but it still happens. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of hockey careers that have ended because guys got down the wrong path. And, uh, you know, juniors is a spot where it, it can, it can be the end of it, you know, because yep. again, there's idle time. I would take the stance on this, that, um, 100% of the teams have alcohol issues. 100%. You've got kids that are 20 years old. You've got kids that have, uh, you know, been in, in juniors for three or four years, they they feel compelled to uh, live the lifestyle. Now, some, it might be one kid. Uh, some, it might be half the team. Some, it might be the whole team. Uh, in the AJHL, I've experienced teams that have a happy hour where the coaches go with the players because the drinking age is either 18 or 19. Uh, and I'm not kidding. The... I went up to visit my son, and this is only a couple of years ago, and the team had a happy hour, and the coaches sent over pitchers of beer for the players. You know, not even, <laughs> you know, and it's a raise the glass, and hey, after games, the coaches and the players may not be together, but they'd be at the same institution, you know, the, the same bar. Um that, that's an, I don't even know if that's an extreme, but that's one example, uh, alcohol. I, I would say that 10 to 20% of the, the teams or the, 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 the composition of the team have a, a dope issue, a pot issue. Um, once again, that's a different mindset from the way we grew up because, you know, pot was that pure athlete, but now it's, it's so accepted in some markets that, uh, you know, it's just, it, it, they look at it differently. It's just a different thing across the board. Uh, people are rattling off all kinds of, you know, the, I'm getting comments in different ways right now from this one's a sensitive one. I know, but uh, I wish you were showing some of these. Uh, not, not, not that one. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but the idea is, is that you're not going to get away from it. Educating your kid, you know, the way I kind of handle things is apparent. And, and by, I made a lot of mistakes as a parent, as far as junior hockey goes. Um, but I, I tried to check in at like 10 o'clock every night, a little phone call, a little text, what's going on, where you at, you know, or I'd FaceTime from time to time where I'd, uh, 
you know, I actually have to you know, get him on. Even my daughter, just get the face on, and you can you can tell a lot by the the uh, the squinting of the eyes about what's going on. You know, and uh, you know, hey, dad, you know, you you know, it's a okay, we got to talk. You know, one of those things. <laughs> um, but that didn't really come till he was twenty. You know, it didn't happen at the earlier ages because the coach was right there with him. Hey, FaceTime with your dad. How you doing? You know, and I'm not kidding about that. That was really going on at the time. So um, that's all I got to say. Just be prepared that there's nothing squeaky clean out there. There is nothing. Some coaches have the, if I don't see it, I don't have to say anything about it. And they can, you know, preach a good game, but then they also bury their head in the sands and only if it becomes an issue. Other coaches check the billet house. They stop by the billet houses. They get to know the billet parents and make sure they're leaning on them to do the right things. Billet parents can be just as bad. I've seen issues where, you know, the ones that get me are the, the 50 year old, uh, and I'm stereotyping, but that's the way it's going to be. Cause I've seen it more than once. The 50 year old, um, divorcee or widow that gets into the billeting world. And this is not cliche like the movies, but they, they want to be the fun person. They want to be they want the kids to hang around in the pool in the backyard or the, the uh, pool table in the, in the basement. And so they're very liberal on the allowing of, of alcohol to be in the house. So you know, usually if you see three quarters of your team hanging out the same place all the time, you might want to question that and find out why they're hanging out there all the time. Cause that's usually something to do with it. So. Um, or you might, you might have a kid that's uh, local to the area and uh, you know, they're at their buddies' houses or their own house, like their own house, not their billet house, um, you know, things like that. But, you know, your kids are going to get exposed to drinking and drugs and things like that when they play junior hockey, just like when they go to college. If they had not yeah. gone to juniors and they just went to college, they're going to be at parties or fraternity parties or whatever, and they're going to be exposed to it. So it's just being it's prepared probably, for that. It's probably the same ratio. You know, it, it, it's probably the same type of ratio you see – Maybe less the college. If, if I recollect college, uh, maybe the dope was a you know much higher percentage than what you'll see in junior hockey. But you know we're not advocating this by any means by having this conversation. We're just pointing it out that it does exist, and you have to be prepared as a parent for that. Um, two more, real quick. Um, one is lack of technology. Um, the, the dirty side of it is every team. Every team will say, "Oh yeah, we've got video." And then they don't see video all year long, or they'll see video once, two or three times during the year. And then when they're watching it, they're just watching the game. The kid, they, it's almost like the, the the substitute teacher, the assistant coach rolls in, brings the TV in the locker room, you know, puts the uh, game on, and they just all sit around and watch the game, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't really do anybody any good. Then it becomes just a, uh, it, it becomes a vanity piece. Oh, did you see that hit? Oh, you see that? You know, and they're they're watching for their shifts versus trying to learn a system. So I would say that if there's one thing you can jump into and, you know, I have asked this question in many times and I've had this question asked me, can you show me what you do with video? Just, can you show me? And there are teams that have, you know, literally instantaneous video cut when the kids are on the bus halfway home, they're already getting emails with all their, their game shifts and the, and the, there's technology to do that. And in the assistant coach, one of the assistant coaches or the head coach are actually putting notes on it. Sometimes there's a live chat going on on the bus on the way home with lots of interaction. Maybe you're not sitting with the coach, but he's commenting and, you know, going back and forth with five, six, eight players at the same time as they watch their film and watch their, their uh, shifts. So, but especially at tier three, there's a lot of people that say they have video, but really don't actually break down and do anything with video. So be prepared for that. Mike. Yeah, I think the best when you were talking about it, I think the best way to sum it up is there's a lot of lazy people, right? When you're, uh, you know, any day job that that any of us have, there's there's coworkers that we have that, you know, just kind of mail it in and, you know, they don't take it as serious or they don't give 100% every day. And I know it's hard to give 100% in your job every day, but there's a lot of people that are lazy, you know, that are doing hockey as a career and they're content with where they're at and, you know, they're not going to go above and beyond and they're, they're not trying to get to a higher level, which means they're not willing to grind and do all the things that are necessary to make your players better and win and advance and develop and all that stuff. So you got to know what type of program you're getting into, because if you just ask them, you know, like I talked about with, uh, you know, their plan for injuries and 
and what they have. If you ask them, everyone does video and they probably do video, but not everybody does video every single day. Not everybody breaks down not only their own film, you know, and what they're trying to do to improve or to execute, but then also is breaking down the opponent's film and their tendencies and habits and how you want to attack and, you know, merging the two together on a week to week basis um, is a lot of work, you know, cause you got to clip those films and you got to watch those games. Um, and there's a lot of people that either don't have the technology to have it done for them and aren't willing to do that themselves, or they're not willing to do it themselves, even when they're being provided it, because you actually have to sit down with your team and you have to explain all these different things. And, you know, they're just not willing to do it. And, and that's a problem. I agree. Uh, couldn't have said it better. Listen, folks, we got two more. We'll get through these quickly. But throw your comments in. What do you think about this list? Has it been helpful? Uh, do you like this? Is it too uncomfortable to talk about? Are we are we getting too close to the bone on some things? Uh, do you think we're full of, you know what? You know, are, are we full of shizzle on this? Well, that is true. We are full of that. But that's yeah. every episode. That almost sounds like schnitzel. You know, I, I did take that trip to Germany for two weeks, and man, there was some good food over there. I enjoyed the hell out of that trip. Uh, well, With your leader hosens? I, I didn't get a pair that would fit me, but uh, I thought about it because <laughs> I wanted to dance around with Lederhosen on and, you know, leather pants on and see what yeah. it was like. To, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, two more. Um, and like I said, these are in no order, but please throw your comments on. <clears throat> Let us know what you're thinking. Let us know what you, you if you gained anything out of this. Um, discipline. <laughs> this is a big one. Uh, discipline. No matter how you look at the sport, uh, your discipline is most likely not going to match the team's discipline. Uh, if you're severely, uh, if you're if you're a hard ass parent, the team's not going to live up to your expectations for the most part. If you're a, a super liberal parent, you're going to feel like the team's coming down so hard on your kid. And discipline is not equal for player from player to player. Now, sometimes it's a logical. In a situation. I'll give you an example. Um, first line player and a fourth line player break the same rule. Fourth line player sits a whole period for it. First line player misses two shifts. And then right off the bat, you're like, ah, oh, that's not fair. That's not fair. Well, the fourth line player only gets two shifts a period. So he sat two shifts. First line player sat the same two shifts. But as a parent, you'll never see that and understand that. But that's on the positive side of a coach that's really proactive and is really trying to do the right thing and is trying to, you know, be equitable on his on his uh, discipline. But there are coaches that, with their bias, you know, it's it's recency bias. Yeah, you, know, you took another penalty. See, you took another penalty. Now the kid may have not taken three penalties in a row, but a month ago the coach talked about him about taking too many penalties. And as soon as he takes a penalty, he's sitting in the stands the next game because he's taking too many penalties. Where Johnny on the second line uh, takes two penalties every game, and the coach basically skates him because uh, skates him meaning doesn't do anything with him, you know, blows by the issue or overlooks the issue. Um, you, you've got a lot of coaches out there that aren't you know educated in the process of managing a team and managing people. They might be good on the X's and O's. They may be super good on recruiting and bringing the right players in. But it doesn't mean that the discipline is going to be fair or equal or even you know, logical in many cases. So it, once again, just be prepared for this and, and know how to see it. Um, and, and sometimes as a parent, you're going to be biased right off the bat yourself that they're picking on your your you know precious little son. Okay, <laughs> that that's the case. You might be biased that uh, the coach never sees the other kid do it. Okay, that you might be right on all those things. The one thing I would do is whatever your son is telling you on the phone, take 10% of it, knock off 90% right off the bat for the first time he mentions it. Now, if it's continual, then there might be a problem there. But most kids will will embellish it first with their parents, trying to get that their parents on their side for the argument, even if they're wrong. And we buy in as parents. We buy in, oh, jeez. I can't believe. What did you say he did? Oh, he sat you for a whole period? Oh, my God. I got to call that guy right now. Refrain from that, but know 
that there might be some truth to it. And there might be some, uh, where that smoke is, there might be some fire. And there's a lot of coaches that are just really shitty at understanding how to discipline and manage a team. Mike? Yeah, I don't know if I have too much to add to that other than, you know, I hate when that happens, but it will happen because there's always, you know, bias and and there's, uh, you know, as a coach myself, you know, it's like you go into the, the, the game and, and there's, uh, you know, your star player turns the puck over two or three times and, you know, they don't miss a shift. And then your fourth line guy goes and, and you know, delivers a pizza to the other team and, you know, they get sat for the next uh, three or four shifts. And it's like, you look at it and you're like, well, what the hell? And, you know, sometimes uh, people can't see the five or six or seven good things that the one player did that's affecting the team in a positive way to negate some of the negatives that they had. And, and that's why they're continuing to get that shift. And, you know, the other player hadn't had any positive things and just the one negative. So you got to like every scenario is different. But um, you gotta you gotta kind of have some patience with that and see if it was a, a situation that played out maybe in the wrong way or if there's a pattern with how the coach handles things and uh, you know hopefully that's not the case. But to your point, you know some of these guys they don't know how to handle. They're not used to managing people. They're used to coaching hockey or they used to play hockey and then reached a certain point and then, then became a coach. So yep. he's still maybe learning how to manage this whole thing. And what are some of the unintended consequences to some of the decisions that I make? And, you know, that plays out over time with experience. And, you know, some of these guys don't have it, especially if it's a, like a lower level, you know, junior team, a tier three team. Some of these coaches are, you know, in their twenties and they just got done playing. Like they don't have all the all the, you know, experience that some of these other guys do to know what to do in these situations. My son's first null assistant coach was two years older than him. <laughs> exactly. He only had one year as a video uh, camera guy for a, a junior team under his belt. And then he's a null assistant coach. Um, and that's a true story. I, I, I'm not going to rat out the team or rat out the, uh, the situation. Um, but he, absolutely. You just, uh, you got to realize some of these people are in the, especially assistant coaches, they're in the learning mode too. They're in the learning mode of trying to learn how they, and some of them, you know, what they think and perceive an assistant coach is supposed to do, you know, Oh, I got to come in and yell at the players in between periods. That's the least effective thing. And between periods, if your kids don't know what they're doing, your team doesn't know what they're doing and, and you're going to try to motivate them between periods. And that's where you're going to change everything. You haven't done your job for the four practices you had that week. You know, that's just, <laughs> that's just the bottom line. Um, last one. Uh, first of all, thanks for the uh, the comments, folks. Thanks for sticking with us. We've had a great audience tonight. Um, once again, if you if you want to throw comments out there, one of the questions that came up is, is this available? Yes, this will be available on uh, our all of our platforms. It'll be on our Facebook platform. It'll be on our YouTube platform uh, right away. Last one, uh, Mike. Have you ever heard of Good Old Boys? Is there a good, yeah. old, is there a good old boy network out there in hockey? A hundred percent. I mean, and that in and that's just not in the junior world. That's from the NHL down to youth hockey. You know, in whatever state or city you're in, there's a Good Old Boy network where there's people that have been you know playing together and they became coaches together and they became you know administrators together and you know things like that. It's the same at every level and you know they try to help each other out you know because that's that's their group you know and for the most part you know it it works to um you know keep consistency within you know whatever level it is and whatnot but there's a lot of issues that also get played into that with preferential treatment not only for each other but you know certain programs or certain players that are connected with the good old boys system in some way um, and for that, it's, you know, it's got its, its negatives to, to the good old boys thing too. Yeah. The, the good old boy network absolutely exists. Um, you know, to, to some extent you and I are part of a good old boy network, positive or negative because of who we know in the game and, you know, what circles we run in inside the game. Um, understanding that and handling it professionally, uh, is, 
is what you need to do, but not everybody understands that. Here's some examples of some good old boy network things that, that, you know, I've seen that I don't like, um, good old boy network, uh, coach goes to the other coach after the game and says, Hey, you know, number five on our team is really close to being the scoring leader this year. Um, I'm going to throw on, you know, two or three assists. Uh, you, you saw that, right. You saw that he got an assist on that one. In other words, you know, manipulating the score sheet and, and getting a buy-in from the other coach. Cause in some leagues you have to have, before you add to the score sheet, both teams have to agree or acknowledge them. Others, the teams can do it individually without having to, uh, to get a buy-in. Some it's done only by the league. You know, the teams can prompt for that extra assist. The, the other one is, um, all-star games, uh, all league teams, um, you know, sh- showcases at the end of the year where players are get rewarded for things like, uh, you know, league MVP, you know, a lot of those things, you know, a, a coach can get his team to, to uh, uh, get his buddies on other teams to buy into whatever he's selling. A lot of it's almost bullying where you get a coach that's, a, you know, a, a personality. He'll actually just start saying things that the other coaches he expects them to fall in line with. I, I, I think the one thing that bothers me with the good old boy network is, um, you know, parents, you know, there's a lot of chances for parents at tier three to go talk to other coaches, to talk to other teams inside and outside your own league. And there's opportunities to talk to advisors. And this is where I caution you at all times. Don't bitch about your coach or anybody to other people. Keep it to yourself. If they even tried to pull that information out of you, they could be, you know, it could be a setup. The coach could be coming to the advisor and going, Hey, Ask them what they think, what's going on. Get their opinion. Are they are they bitching behind the scenes because the coach is looking for a, a scapegoat on a player? He's looking for a reason because he's already you know got it out for a player. Don't trust anybody uh, with y- your negative thought process. Keep it to yourself. You have to because there is a good old boy network. It's vast. It goes across all leagues. It doesn't just – it's not like there's this dark uh, – There there isn't a, uh, you know, there isn't a conspiracy out there against parents. There isn't a conspiracy out there. But you just don't, never know who they they uh, who they who talk to on a daily basis. There's some coaches that talk almost every day and, and advisors that are, you know, an old buddy and, you know, word gets around. So be very cautious of that. What Thoughts on that, Mike? Yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot to add, but um, you definitely want to be careful what you say because, you know, everybody probably listening has heard that, Hockey is a very small community, and really the only people that get involved in hockey are people who had played it. So you had, you know, there's so many people that I played with that are now in the coaching world, and then I've coached now for over 20 years. So there's not only you know people that I've been coaching with or against that have moved on to higher levels, but there's kids that I've coached over 20 years that are now moving on to higher levels. So just like you know, they do that whole Kevin Bacon, like, what is it, uh, six degrees of separation or whatever. When I look at my own, like, coaching tree or playing tree and how many people I'm connected with, it's vast. So and that's just me. And then you connect me and you and who do we have in common and and whatever. And, it, you know, we've before we even, like, really knew each other and we started to get to know each other, it was like, we connected on so many different levels and people and areas we lived and, you know, all this other stuff. And we're generations apart as far as like, from a playing standpoint. Generations. Maybe, maybe maybe generation. Generations. <laughs> generations. Let's freaking not go to generations. I did not but, play in World War II. <laughs> well, pretty close. Um, but my point, you know, remains is that, uh, we're just talking about you and I, when you start splintering now, you know, out from there, it is a very, very small community. So you got to be careful what you say, because people will try to use that against you or yep. it'll get into the wrong hands. And, you know, it, it's not a good situation for, for anyone. And we've all stumbled on this in the past. Every coach, if you've been involved with this game for, you know, the, the one or two years that Mike's been involved or the 30 plus years I've been involved uh, you'll, you'll say something that it might be mild that comes back to you. It might be major that, that comes back to you and you get egg on your face and you'll, you learn by it. But if there's a piece of advice is just keep your mouth shut. You know, if, if, uh, 
if somebody tries to goad you into a conversation, a negative conversation about uh, somebody that's in the, this as a professional, an industry professional, uh, just smile, smile and nod and say, oh, I, I haven't really had that experience with him yet, you know, uh, because it's not going to get you anywhere positive to jump on the bandwagon in those situations. So um, awesome. Tell us what you think. Let us know what, what you, you thought of this conversation. Uh, we will break this up when we put this on uh, YouTube. By the end of the week, I'll have this by chapter so that all 17, we did, we did 17, Mike. We did 17 different topics tonight and got through them all. We'll, we'll make sure we break these down, clean it up a little bit, and try to condense it a little bit. Uh, but I'd sure love to see your thoughts. I'd sure love to know what, what your comments are on this. And if you got another one, if you agree or disagree, put it on there. We'd love to see in the comments uh, do you agree with what we're saying? Do you disagree with what we're saying? The other thing, too, is do you have something to add? Is there something we missed that maybe we should talk about in the future? Uh, Mike, I know I kind of threw this at you tonight. Thank you so much. You did a great job, and uh, you <laughs> added a lot of insight that uh, I didn't even think about, so I appreciate uh, not only did you go into this blind, but uh, you, you really were able to still contribute. Uh, that, that was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, 